This is the Jeff Orovitz Show on 97.1 The Big Talker. All right, this hour as we continue to bring you candidates for the upcoming primary, we're going to talk to one of the candidates for governor, Scott Neely. The Jeff Orvitz Show starts now. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for listening. Jeff Orvitz here. Happy to be here with you today. May 12th, Thursday, May 12th, 2022, show number 1376 for my podcast listeners. And thank you to everyone who subscribed to the podcast. Remember, you can do that by going to talkwithjeff.com if you haven't done that already. Uh, busy program as I continue to bring you candidates and have in-depth conversations with these folks uh, that really not too many people are doing around the state. Nobody's doing it in northern Arizona like I do it. And I, I appreciate the candidates spending time with us. I appreciate you listening. And we're going to keep getting as many of them who are willing and who reply and get back to me as as, as many of them as possible. I've had most of the Republican candidates for governor on, and we've got Scott Neely coming up. He's another candidate who's on the ballot for, for this uh, August primary for governor. Uh, there's one more that I still haven't heard from, so we're getting close to the end here of my request for folks to come on, and then I, I hope to get them all back on, hopefully a second time uh, before the, like I said, August 2nd primary. So we'll talk with Scott Neely here in just a couple minutes, and then uh, I think in the second hour, Olivia will join me, and we'll go over some of your comments. So if you want to chime in, go ahead and send an email, talk with Jeff at iCloud.com. Thanks to Just Wireless for sponsoring our email, talk with Jeff at iCloud.com. She's got some of your comments lined up we'll look at new ones coming in so keep those coming uh and we'll get to some arizona news items including um this is a good one uh thieves stealing an atm (laughs) we'll talk about you know the atm machine uh also uh let's talk a little bit about social equity pot licenses you know marijuana licenses social equity marijuana licenses sometimes i think we've just gone to the twilight zone right uh let's see i'd love to mention our first sponsor and it, this is a good one here because it's thursday it's timely it's it's ladies day uh for the rest of the uh day the rest of the evening here out at timberline firearms and training Ladies, hey, you can get $10 range time plus that includes one free gun rental. So take advantage of this. This is great because you get to try it before you buy it. And everybody has kind of a different need when it comes to firearms. And you hate to buy one that you've never tried out and find out that it's it's just the wrong fit for you. Uh, so ladies, take advantage of this uh, lane time and this gun rental for 10 bucks out at Timberline Firearms and Training. And everybody should take advantage of Timberline Firearms and Training uh, courses, whether you're new to firearms, whether their first shots program is great, intermediate handgun training. They have tons of other training opportunities all the way up to expert level. you got to give Timberline Firearms and Training a call right now because they have limited availability, 928-526-7900. That's 928-526-7900. Or you can go to TimberlineFirearms.us or just take a quick drive. Timberline Firearms and Training, just five minutes north of the Flagstaff Mall. Uh, just go on out there and check out their Liberty Safes, their ammunition, their accessories, and then t- utilize their world-class indoor shooting range. All right, let's talk with another candidate for Arizona governor here, Scott Neely. And like I said, this primary is coming up here August 2nd. Uh, the ballots go out here, I believe, July 6th or, sh- or so. So so we don't have a lot of time left uh, before this primary hits. And we'll continue to bring you candidates, more and more candidates, uh, as we get closer and closer. But anyway, let's talk with, uh, welcome to the program, first time on the show, uh, running to be Arizona's governor in the upcoming Republican primary, Scott Neely. Scott, hey, welcome to the program. How are you doing today? Doing well, thank you, and I, I thank you for having me on your show. I really appreciate it. I've been real busy, so thank you for fitting yeah. me in, and, and, and hope yeah. you're having a good day up there in the beautiful weather. It's yeah. getting hot down here. Yeah, it's getting hot there. You know, it's just been wind and wind, and we'll, we'll talk about the fire danger that, you know, most of the state's under, and I know forest health is a big issue for you. I've been uh, looking at your website, and you're out there, uh, the, the primary coming up here before we know it, um, August 2nd. Why don't you give us the kind of 30,000 foot of, uh, you know, introduce yourself to, to the listeners here and, you know, your life story in like, in like, you know, 90 seconds. <laughs> sure. All right. So I've, I've been a businessman in the Phoenix metropolitan area for the last 17 years. Um, 
I own three small businesses. One's, one's, uh, one's an online store for concrete equipment. One is a concrete, uh, business. And then the other is a supply business where I supply concrete. So those are the types of businesses that I, that I run and own. And I have personally been working on the border wall with my own two hands for the past 17 years of my life during the times when we have the, the sane administration, the sane administrations with common sense mm-hmm. governing and allow me to go do my job and, and help build that wall to help keep us safe from, from uh, illegal invaders that are not coming through the door the right way, but are coming through, you know, the open points in the wall the wrong way. Um, and then bringing drugs and, and smuggling in children and women with them oftentimes. Is there so, much work uh, going on now, Scott? I mean, there, there's none, yeah, zero, okay. zero. There's a little repairs here and there once in a while and some spots that have been damaged by, by some of these people that are coming. But uh, other than that, there's no major uh, work being done to complete and finish the wall. There's open trenches everywhere. There's footings dug ready to be poured of concrete. They're just sitting there open. Um, it's just a, it's a geological mess over there right now. The wall needs to be finished really, but, uh, with this administration uh, running the country, Biden's administration, I, I guess that's not going to be done. And I don't see Doug Ducey, our current Doug governor, doing anything about it. I'm very displeased with uh, with him blaming Biden, but then him doing nothing about it himself. Oh, he took a he took a picture though. I saw that. Where I mean, he, he did. Oh, I the, think he <laughs> took. Yeah. He, he took a picture of them walking through, and then he let them walk through. What a guy. Yeah, and this has come up a lot. And we're talking with Scott Neely, who's running for the Republican nomination for governor here in Arizona. Um, it's a question that comes up a lot, which is, what do you do if you, you know, get, get to the Capitol? You're on the ninth floor there. What do you do as governor if uh, you're going to have two more years of Biden? We don't know what's going to happen in 24. What do you do? Do you do something on your own? The first thing you do is you deputize a posse. You use the sheriffs of the state to deputize a posse. You also get the Arizona National Guard out there on that border. And then you take the $5 billion infrastructure money. We have earmarked coming to Arizona from the Biden infrastructure deal. You take that money, some of that, and you begin to construct three strategic National Guard border barracks on the border of Arizona and Mexico in the areas that are highest of traffic so that we can have a militarized presence in those areas and deter people from wanting to come through the Arizona border. Uh, that would be what I would do on day one when I take office. I would I would sign an executive order on day one to do those things. Obviously, I'd have to get the state legislature to help me to authorize funds to do that. So I'd work with the legislature. Hopefully, we get a conservative legislature, and so we can work together for the common good and the protection of the state of the Arizona in the state of Arizona. And it's, it's interesting because I've asked the question of why, when you saw that photo op of the gap in the wall, why why the governor didn't do something. I've had on members of Congress and asked them, hey, let's go out there. And, and I was real simple with this, Scott. I was like, let's put some posts in the ground and at least put a temporary fence, something. You know, anything, anything. Yeah. Dig a hole and, yeah. and, and, and yeah. get a four by four treated post in there. I know that's very simple. But yeah. um, he's like, well, they'll probably arrest you. You know, the, it, yeah. but as a governor, I, I don't see unless it's for criminal activity, which maybe the feds would say that you you put up a wall yourself is criminal activity. But generally speaking, they, I don't see governors. Being, would. I, yeah, I don't see governors being arrested, though, when they do things like that and defy the feds on that level. You know, he could do something. He just doesn't want to do something. He's busy coming up with plans to build desalinization plants in Mexico to provide them and supposedly us with water. I wouldn't build a desalinization plant in Mexico and put my water energy security in the hands of corrupt Mexican officials, dr- uh, drug cartels, uh, terrorists. Why would we? Why would we clean water there in Mexico when we could very easily just take the existing desalinization plant we currently have, which is in Yuma, okay. make it bigger, make it much bigger. We could pipe the water to Yuma and then we could clean the water in Yuma. And then from Yuma, we could ship the water all over the state, and then it's cleaned up there. We don't have to worry about it being terrorized or poisoned or terrorism or stolen from or anything like that. Over there in Mexico, oftentimes you have the cartel stealing oil out of their oil pipelines over there uh, going between Texas and, and Juarez. They got some oil pipelines that go into Juarez over there, and oftentimes you've got the cartel stealing oil from the Mexican government. Why wouldn't they steal water? that's being sold by the Mexican government to Arizona. They would, I can assure you they would, they'd steal water and then 
there's always that chance that the water could be poisoned before it got here or on its way here. I mean, what if they dumped a ton of fentanyl in that water on its way over here and it got into our water systems here and we charge our water systems with fentanyl poison water and then we go ahead and wipe out most of the population of uh, Arizona? Well, Scott, that could happen. You bring up uh, an interesting point here. Two points. I want to stick to water and I want to stick to the Arizona budget as well because the, the governor had proposed a budget of 14 and a quarter billion dollars, which is two and a quarter billion, like two billion, let's say, uh, just round figure bigger than last year, which was a billion dollars bigger than the previous year, which was a billion dollars bigger than the previous. You get my yeah. drift here. This thing has increased dramatically. And every time it's a fiscally responsible conservative budget, that's the, the wording that comes out of, uh, Governor Ducey's office. Uh, one of the things, because they have billions in, in so-called surplus was this, uh, desalinization point. So there's two points here first of all is is the budget too big are they taking too much money um let, let's start with that one and what would you do when you're faced with potentially a few billion dollars extra from the previous year i don't think you should go and go ahead and burn through all your extra money you've got sitting in the bank i think you should hold on to some of that that's why i proposed using the money that's earmarked coming from the federal government and stimulus money we use that money to build the desalinization plant in Yuma to finish the wall okay. and to construct those border barracks. We don't take it out of the general fund from Arizona money. We take it and to- put it towards, you know, projects that are for the, 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 for the security of Arizona that are for our national security interests, which is water, the wall and the border barracks. And it is interesting. I didn't even know there was a, a desalinization plant in Yuma. I, I'll claim ignorance it, on that one. Very old technology from 1992. Okay. And, and it was built for the farmers and it was built, built for low salinity water. Uh, it wasn't built for salt water coming out of the ocean. It was built okay. for a lower salinity water than that. And obviously technology's advanced a bunch and, um, you see countries like Israel doing phenomenal things with de- desalinization and, oh, yeah. you know, and, and, and on and on. So there, there are the resources and the technology to do this, Scott. But the, something you, when you bring up Mexico and building something that big, potentially a billion dollars, whatever it may cost in a foreign country, I think about our supply chain issues and how the whole supply chain system has broken down over the past two and a half years. We were all told we would go global and we'd have a just-in-time supply method, and that's fallen apart. You can't, you can't even get baby food, things like that. Uh, our apple juice comes from China. I mean, how, how pathetic. And we, we ship the apples over there, and it comes back as juice. How pathetic is we that? We ship the copper over there, and they smelt it. We ship yeah. everything over there, and they take care of it. Yeah, so look. Let's maybe not re. I, I I would like to see a desalinization plant, perhaps. Although the funding is is tricky for me, but um, let's learn from the lessons of the last two and a half years, which is this system ain't working. No, it's not. They're just spending money like drunken sailors. <laughs> they're, they're good at that. Don't insult the sailors. <laughs> right, right. Um, all right, folks. We are talking with Scott Neely, who's running for the Republican nomination for uh, Arizona governor. Um, Scott, let's do this. I, I want to come back and talk. Um, we got housing, we got education, we got inflation, we got forest health. Uh, we covered water, so we're good there. Let's get into yeah. all that and uh, hang tight. Uh, we'll talk more with Scott Neely in just a second. And if you got a comment, I'd love to hear from you. Send an email, talk with Jeff at iCloud.com. That's talk with Jeff at iCloud.com. Sponsor of the segment of the show is Kelly Broadus Real Estate Advisors. Look, you want to work with the best, and Kelly is the best. She's in the top 2% of all realtors in the nation, and uh, she can advise you the best ways to, to sell your house. You want to get out of the market. You want to you want to move into a new home. You want to move completely out of the state. She'll be able to help you out. Uh, also, if you're trying to get into this very heated housing market, and I've been talking a lot this week about uh, how Arizona has seen the largest increases in pricing and is one of the hottest real estate markets in the nation. That means it's, it's tougher to get into these homes. But Kelly brought us, she can help you out. Uh, plus, she'll also talk to you about vacation rentals, and she has some concerns about those in certain areas, certain neighborhoods that may be banning them uh, through their, uh, you know, the, the neighborhood associations and, the you know, the CCRs. So call Kelly brought us. She can advise you on all of this. Plus, Plus, go to her website right now. You can instant home valuation. Go to northernarizonafinehomes.com. That's northernarizonafinehomes.com. And give Kelly a call right now at 928-606-6749. That's Kelly Broadus at 928-606-6749. Let's continue with Scott Neely when we come back. Hang tight. Back in just a minute.
Jeff Orvitz here, and I've got some office space available for you at FlagstaffForLease.com. Office suites start at $499. I also have a larger six-room suite available for about $1,600 and other configurations up to 6,000 square feet and all points in between. Give me a call at 928-526-7909. That's 928-526-7909. Or go to Flagstaff, the number four, Lease.com. That's FlagstaffForLease.com. All right, welcome back. I'd love to hear from you. Send an email, talk with Jeff at iCloud.com. We'll get back to Scott Neely here in just a second, running to be Arizona's next governor. Uh, don't forget to call my friends at the Blind Brothers when you're, when you're looking for blinds, shutters, or shades. The great thing I like about them is, first of all, an Arizona company. You work directly with them. You work with their their experience. You never have to work with subcontractors, which is huge. The Blind Brothers will lay out all your options, not just the most expensive ones to fit your style and to fit your budget. Right now, mention the Jeff Orvitz Show. Get half off installation in addition to any other advertised specials. Do your neighbors a favor. Call the Blind Brothers for a free estimate at 928 634 2423. That's 928 634 2423, or you can go to theblindbrothers.com. Scott Neely is with us running uh, for Arizona governor. Um, Scott, let's get into uh, the, the housing issues. Yeah. It's. I just talked about a report, I think it was from Moody's, that put Arizona as one of the biggest increases in the nation as far as housing. Uh, the Phoenix metro area was specifically mentioned. Uh, Kingman and Lake Havasu and Flagstaff. Uh, I see politicians making housing their, like their top priority, but I always get a little concerned because I, I start thinking about they're, they're going to start building housing, and uh, I think they're going to mess it up. What do you What do you do about housing? Should you do anything well, well, as governor? Here's the thing about housing. You can't build houses unless you have human beings to build them. Yeah. You can't 3D way your print out of it. You cannot 3D, 3D print your way out of this problem. So some, millenn- might some millennials will disagree with you, but go ahead. They'll, 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 <laughs> they think they can try. I mean, you can try to 3D print houses, but the problem with 3D printing houses is you're going to have what would look like a 1950s communist <laughs> compound that, that looks like something made in Russia. Yeah. And uh, I don't think most people want to live in something like that. I think they want to live in something nice and cozy and comfortable. And that's not going to be a 3D printed house. Uh, we have a massive labor shortage, but we have a massive surplus of labor in prison. Why are we not using our prison population to help us to build things? Why are we not setting them up trade schools within the prison system so that they can learn the skills that we need out here right now in the real world so we can put framers to work, so we can put concrete guys to work, so we can put welders to work. A lot of these guys in prison, they made a mistake at a young age. Maybe they're serving 10 years. Maybe it was, you know, an accidental car wreck and manslaughter, you name it, whatever it is. A lot of people aren't bad. They just made mistakes and they need a second chance. And they're going in with no skills a lot oftentimes because that's how they end up in there. They didn't have skills to begin with. So they do criminal activities or criminal things. Oftentimes they end up in prison. They don't have skills. They come out with no skills. They reoffend and go back in because there's no trade schools. America is so focused on higher education that they're leaving out those that are not qualified to go into higher education. There's so many people that go to college to higher education schools and only last a couple of years, get themselves $50,000 in debt and then don't can't see the light at the end of the tunnel. They, they, and you know, and they didn't learn trade skills either. So they're kind of just, they're kind of just in a bad spot living on their mom and dad's couch, maybe going out and drinking too much at night. One night they have a a DUI wreck and all of a sudden they're serving 10 years in prison. Well, we can take those people, we can train them, give them skills they need so that when they get out, they can get jobs that pay 28, 32, $55 an hour. Cause right now that's the kind of money that you can make in the trades. So we should take these nonviolent prisoners. There's a lot of them in there and we should train these guys how to be tradesmen because a lot of these guys just don't know how to do things. Yeah. You know, a lot of these guys didn't have fathers in the home and, and, and without a father, you're not going to learn how to, how to frame a house, how to pour concrete, how to, how to weld something, how to fix a car. You know, mom doesn't usually have those skills. She can't give you those skills. And and nowadays, with the way the family court system is and whatnot, usually the kids go to the mom if there's a any kind of custody thing going on. And then the mom cannot train the boys how to do those those trades. 
And, and so we need, we need trade schools, trade skills. We can train, train people right out of high school in the trades. We can carve out a section in the state colleges or in the community colleges, or we could, we could expand EVIT, make it bigger, add more trade lines to it. Cause EVIT really just focuses on uh, welding and like HVAC and, and, and electrical and plumbing. And that's kind of the only things they focus on. They could expand it into roofing and framing and concrete and you name it. So there's, so there's those types of things that we can do. Um, so make more to, workers to, available for, to, to, we need to make more workers yeah. available. Everybody okay. thinks you can just import yeah. skilled workers from Mexico and South America, but that doesn't, doesn't work. Those guys coming here, they don't have the skills either. We're, we're having to train those guys. So, Rather than train them, why don't we train our own? Are you seeing, uh, Scott, because you're in the, 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 the trades yourself, has it been impossible yeah. to find people or very challenging? Talk about that It's real impossible quick. to yeah. find people. Yeah. I've trained my sons and my son-in-laws, and I've trained my brother-in-laws, and I've trained everybody close to me how to do these types of trades. And I've actually taken some prisoners that were nonviolent, and I've, I've turned them into tradesmen too. But I'm only one man, and I can only train so many people. yeah. yeah. There needs to be a lot more of me out there, and there's not a lot of me. I'm what, 41, and there's not a lot of no, me. No, there's not. And what's this, and and I should have told you. My listeners know this. I mean, I, I've been I've come from the trades myself. My my family's in real estate, and we do so much work uh, ourselves, especially right now. I couldn't. I think I talked to you about this. Yeah. Uh, off air, I couldn't find a painter, so I got my daughter. And like my daughter has another job, plus she does stuff here on the show. And I was like, hey, give you 500 bucks, go take care of these couple rooms. I tried to get people, and and continually fail to get people to. to to show or to stay. This is a problem that all my friends in, in the trades are experiencing. This is happening across the country. And yeah. you look at it, someone like you, Scott, and other people who really, they want to train people. They want to have a, do an apprenticeship type thing that seems to have disappeared in this country by and large. And with labor, the way the labor laws are, uh, you know, minimum wage, things like that. It used to be you'd work for really low amounts to try to you yeah. know, figure it all out. You, you can't even do that anymore. No. No, it, well, in the eighties, in the eighties, when I started as a kid in this stuff, you know, if you did piece work, you made a fortune. Uh, yep. um, my, my father-in-law, he's 71 now. We talked about it. He said in the eighties, he was taking down 1200 a week. And then, and then let's go back to when Obama was president. You couldn't even make 1200 a week in the trades, uh, during, during the time of his presidency. So why would anybody want to work in it? It's like 40 years have gone by and you're making the same money they did 40 years ago or less. Nobody wanted to be in the trades. Well, now we need to, we need to alert people and let them know that the trades are now paying again and they're paying very well, better than I've ever seen the trades ever pay in the history of the United States. Yeah. Right now, tradesmen can make as much as a doctor or a lawyer in the right trade, doing, doing the right things, you know, with the right skill sets. Yeah. And, and you know what? It's something that as far as I know, until the robots come, Scott, you, you can't outsource it. A concrete finisher, uh, someone doing drywall, um, um, you know, carpentry, what, what you name it. These are things that are always needed. Although uh, you've been in this forever. Sometimes it rains. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes there's periods yeah. where, you know, there's not that work. Um, but you always have that trade. And our school system has just taught people you're going to go to college. You're going to get a job. You're going to sit at a cubicle basically, which is fine. I'm not downing that, but not fine for everybody. And I, I hope our country's moving away from that, but I, I don't know because you still can't hire people. Well, I don't think they're moving away from that. They're still pushing. My sons are graduating in, in three weeks from Mesa high school Oh, cool! and they're still pushing them to go to the higher education thing. Yeah. Uh, that's just what they're doing. And, and they don't realize we need to fill some other types of jobs, not just higher education. And my daughter, she went to ASU on a full ride scholarship. She was a higher education kind of person. Uh, but my sons, they're not sure. They might go to do a little bit of community college or something like that. Maybe take some business classes and whatnot. But for the most part, they've already learned trades with me that can pay well. And then they, they're they also thinking about going to EVIT and learning some more stuff too. So they could diversify their trade skill sets and then maybe make even more money. That's yeah. kind of what my sons are thinking about. But that's because I kind of put that in their head. A lot of people don't put that in their children's heads. And, yeah. and it's because a lot of the parents don't know. At 41... I've got 18 year old kids and there's a lot of 41 year olds out there from my, from my growing up age, age standpoint, when I was growing up, they were pushing me to go to college, college, college. Mm -hmm. That's what they wanted me to do. And I didn't go that route, which I'm, I'm, I'm thankful I didn't cause I've done so well not having gone that route. But uh, a lot of my friends that went that route 
don't know trades, haven't taught their kids that can't really push their kids in that direction because they themselves didn't, you know, see that kind of work ethic and see that kind of work ability, you know, cause they've all worked in offices. So, yeah, yeah. so they want their kids to kind of do what they do. And yeah. I think we need, we need something different now. Things need to change. Yeah. And which is fine, Scott. But I mean, I, I also run into people all the time that can't do anything anymore. And I'm not trying no, to be true. critical. Can't you can't change, change a light bulb. Can't, yeah, oh, oh, yeah. I said you can't change a tire. can't change a light bulb. I've had people Listen, call me. I'm driving on the 202 freeway, and I'm not joking. I just drove by just, just a couple minutes back now that we're on that subject. I just drove by a girl changing her tire and her boyfriend on the cell phone watching what? her change the tire. <laughs> not joking, dude. I just drove oh, by this guy. Oh, man. America 2022. Yeah. And, um, and, and this is the new world. Now, look, I'm not knocking her. That means she probably had a dad. Yeah, good for her. And that dad probably taught her how to change a tire but that probably means he didn't have a dad and he didn't learn how to change a tire so you see where i'm going with yeah, that I, hey i know I, I talk about it all the time all right uh scott can you can you stick around a little longer i want to get into Absolutely. inflation forest health and some other issues so so hang tight yes, and sir. if you guys have a comment we'd love to hear from you uh, send an email talk with jeff at icloud.com that's talk with jeff at icloud.com we're talking with scott neely who's running to be arizona's next governor We'll get into um, inflation and forest health when we come back. Hang tight. Back in a minute. All right. Welcome back. We're going to continue on with Scott Neely running for governor of Arizona here in just a second. Uh, we're going to talk inflation, and I've, I warned about this for a long time. You know, we, we talked about the transitory inflation, which is a bunch of junk. Uh, prices are going up. The inflation numbers are much higher than they actually say. Uh, I do not give financial advice, but I can tell you, me personally, I've always owned a little bit of gold and silver. I like to hold something tangible in my hands. Uh, why don't you give a call right now to my friend Justin and his family at Desert Gold Exchange. Put them to the test with a no-pressure quote. Mention the Jeff Orvitz Show. You can get a free investor's kit. Here's the number, 888-852-4343. That's 888-852-4343. Desert Gold Exchange. And Justin, we'll talk to you about IRAs as well, plus how to get physical gold and silver delivered in, what, like 72 hours. Give Desert Gold Exchange a call right now, 888 852 4343. And we are talking with Scott Neely, who's running for governor of Arizona, uh, the Republican, uh, for the Republican nomination, the, the, um, primary coming up here August 2nd. Uh, Scott, let's talk something that I, I know you're down in the valley and it, you know, you don't. I'm actually driving to another event right now with a, with a group of patriotic people. So okay. I'm heading to that event as we're talking. I'm on, I'm on McDowell and. 7th Street now. Okay. Now I get to see the homeless uh, issues. <laughs> yeah, well, There's yeah. a lot of homeless going on here now, too. It, it, that's huge, too. And, I mean, it com- yeah. compared to California, and hopefully we don't become like California, it's 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 so bad over there. I've heard so Well, I've been to Cass in downtown Phoenix a couple of Sundays ago, and I was feeding the homeless and signing up people to vote. And they love me, by the way. But, anyway, great people, a lot of intelligent people down there. They're just on hard times and on hard luck, and, and minimum wage doesn't even pay – doesn't even pay them well enough to have an apartment if they're a single person alone and they don't have a spouse. You know, if you're making 500 a week and an apartment's 2000 a month, you cannot afford an apartment. So what they do is they live downtown in a tent so they can still afford to buy food. Yeah. Pretty sad. It is sad. Pretty sad. And with inflation going on, and this is a huge issue for Arizona, we're seeing housing costs, that some of the highest, biggest increases in, in the nation. We talked about this already. But you've got inflation cranking. You've got people being paid to stay home. You've got trillions that were pumped into the economy. But, Scott, we're seeing people move and relocate to Arizona businesses. So it's kind of like, well, why can't we get – Full, you know, full employment. I know the numbers say we have very low unemployment, but a lot of people have dropped off. The, yeah, they've dropped off the they're rolls. Lying. So how, they're, how they're do we being, fix that? Listen, that, that the, the Biden infrastructure deal, one trillion of that infrastructure deal is not going to infrastructure. It goes to human infrastructure. Which is? Only 200 billion goes to infrastructure. infrastructure. About 10%. Rough. Well, actually... Then you're cutting out there for a second, so I know I know you're driving, Scott. Can you hear me? 
we, we do have we do have Scott back. I, I thought we only had those problems, uh, Scott, in in northern Arizona, the dead zones. Yeah, I guess it, it happens so. I every. Guess. <laughs> Seventh Street and Osborne right now is where yeah. I'm at, and yeah, apparently I have that problem. Drive up 17, and you hit the overlook, or the, the, you know the the overlook right there as you before you drop down yeah. to Verde Valley, and it's it's like it dies every time there. Anyway, yeah. we are we are talking with Scott Neely, who's running for governor of Arizona, and um, we, we've covered a, a lot of issues. Um, we're, we're talking about the folks who just aren't aren't finding the jobs and the the inflation issues. How do my question was, how do we fix uh, the inflation issue? How do we get these people uh, or these people back to work, I guess I should say, well, or to it's, work it's that you were mentioning? To say. It, it's hard to say. We, the last 30 years, we really haven't been, we haven't been training our people to be yeah. hardworking individuals, you know, physically hardworking individuals that, you know, you have to, you have to toughen this generation up now. We gotta, yeah. we gotta make a change. You know, we gotta start, we gotta start toughening these kids up. I, I'm, I'm tough as leather, but I've been working outside in the heat for my entire life. So, yeah, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm tough as nails. I'm, I'm a rarity. Yeah, but as you're not but, saying, uh, like you mentioned, the guy who's watching the, the, his girlfriend or whatever, we don't know what's going on, you know, change the tire. Uh, maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe he was helping. Maybe he was like, uh, uh <laughs> maybe he was looking up, or maybe he was looking up how to do it on his phone yeah, while he watched her they're YouTubing it. wrench on it. I'm not sure. Yeah. Let's give him the benefit of the See, doubt. Because but I, I just I, saw what I saw. Uh, Scott, I would do something like that. Like my, my daughter Isabel, if the tire went flat, I'd be like, okay, grab that. And you do, I'm not doing it. You know, just, yeah. just as a yeah, I mean, it could be. Maybe, yeah, maybe he was just teaching her how to do it. Let's but hope so. Improbable. <laughs> All right. Let's, let's move on to, uh, forest health. Uh, we've seen devastating fires the earliest I've seen them up here in northern Arizona. Well, the southern Arizona fire that's going on, too. Uh, Prescott's been getting fires, uh, Flagstaff area. I, I mean, it's just it's, it's it's not looking good looking ahead to the rest of spring. Uh, well, you've got different tree sizes that are staggered. That's okay. number one. They're too close together. That's yep. number two. Um, if you go back 150 years, um, back, back in time, we would have about 11 – ponderosa pines per acre and maybe some other smaller trees and stuff in between. Yeah. But now you've got around 1100 per acre. Isn't that a little bit much? Isn't it a little bit too much? I think so. I think the forests need to be thin. I think they need to be strategically thin in certain areas. I don't mean go in there and mow them all down like they used to in the old days when they used to log. But I do mean that we need to go in there and, and maybe cut half of them out of the way for two reasons. One, you know, we don't want these fires to spread and get hotter and completely incinerate the forest. And we also don't want the, the trees sucking too much out of the water table either because people don't realize trees suck a whole lot of gallons per minute daily, every day, and that adds up. And then it does take out of the aquifers, takes away from our water supplies. Those numbers are amazing, Scott. I had I had a rancher tell me a while back. I can't remember the numbers, but like the like the um, juniper and pinion, how much they suck up uh, every day, how many gallons, and yeah, you just you just don't realize it. Well, back to the because tr- this kind of ties together. Back to the trades. Uh, you know what it costs for a sheet of OSB? Um, it's like fifty five yeah, bucks or something now. So expensive! It yeah. was it was twenty two dollars two years ago. Now it's fifty five dollars. It's unbelievable. Exactly, and and we could actually turn that into lumber and make some money too. And and we could we could get rid of some of the water problems by getting rid of half the trees. And we can make the forest healthier. If the forest is healthier, you're going to have less bark beetles. It's going to be less dry. Also, those trees are sharing that water supply. And the more trees there are that share, the less water the others get, which means they dry out, which means the bark beetle attacks them when they're not healthy, which means we have hotter fires. Yeah, and we've seen that. All these things tie together. And not chopping the forest down, as would a lot of Democrats say, don't touch the forest, it's God's forest, you know, or it's Mother Nature's or whatever it is they want to say that it is. The fact is, it still has to be managed. I mean, if we don't manage it, Mother Nature will. She'll manage it for us. But the problem is, if if we incinerate everything, we're going to have a poison water table of fly ash. We're going to have a poison fly ash poison water table. And what most people don't realize is 70% of Arizona's water supply does not come from the Colorado River. It actually comes from northern Arizona. Most people do not realize that. And I'm informing the people now. Yeah. Seventy percent of our water supply comes from northern Arizona. If we incinerate the forest, 
we also incinerate the water supply along with the forest. And we realize that and because we, that water is flowing through northern Arizona and down to the Verde Valley and down to the Verde River and into the Salt River. I mean, it's it's intense, the amount of water that, that flows down that's being really sopped up in, in Maricopa. Yeah. Imagine if you got rid of half the trees. Now you'd have a beautiful forest that you could see through. It would get healthier over time by, by removing half those trees. Your water supplies would increase because you would have less trees sucking the water supply up before it got into the rivers and then worked its way down to Phoenix. So we could probably add 10% to our water supplies just by managing the forest. How do you deal with the feds? Um, I've contended for a long time they control way too much land and just can't handle it. A lot of this is federal land. What do you do? You put trade schools. You put trade schools on the tribal land. You get the you get the tribal people interested in these trade jobs too. Trade jobs can include, uh, you know, forest management, and and then you get the tribes involved. The tribes will help us with the feds. As far as forest management, yeah, the okay. tribes will help us with the feds. If we can if we can show them how this could benefit both the land and their people. The tribes will be the ones going to bat with us with the feds. All right, let's uh, finish up. And we're talking with Scott Neely, uh, who's running to be governor of Arizona, Republican nomination coming up. Uh, I want to end and kind of loop back to education. We've talked a lot about education, but you said on your website, quote, I will make an unprecedented investment and reset in K-12 through college and trade school education, which we've talked about, and training. Um, yeah. Talk about that investment. I mean, are, are we talking about – well? <laughs> what's the re- what's the reset in K through twelve? I, I maybe we should start with that. Well, here here here's an example. So I went to go talk to my son's counselor today at Mesa High about an issue, only to find out Mesa High has five vice principals. <laughs> did you know that? Sounds right. <laughs> I didn't know that. I, I did not know that. So this is news to me. I did say I wanted to shrink the administrative state within within the school system, the unified school districts by shrinking, you know, the school district or, or by, you know, kind of combining school districts, you know, so you have less administration, but I didn't know within each individual school, they have five vice principals, one principal, several administrators over the different education departments within the school. Everybody's micromanaging on top of micromanaging on top of micromanaging here in Arizona. But yet we're ranked 49th in the nation in education. That seems a little bit ridiculous to me. Uh, so the, the vice principal, and I, I talked, I touched on that with him today. I said, well, why do you need five vice principals? He said, well, cause we have 3,500 kids here. <laughs> I said, well, that's kind of odd because I graduated from a school 22 years ago that had about 5,000 kids and we had one principal and one vice principal and education back then was much stronger than it is today. So now you have all these people working and what's getting done because education seems to be getting worse, not better. Yeah. The classrooms seem to be getting fuller, more kids, not less. I was talking to my son today. He said, next year, they're going to have some classes with 40 kids. And they've been for years trying to keep them at 30. But my son said, next year, they're going to actually have classrooms with 40 kids. But my son graduates this year, thank goodness. But uh, classrooms with 40 kids is unacceptable. Here's how you get more teachers. You get rid of four vice principals from Mesa High, and then you only have one vice principal, and you take those vice principal salaries and apply them to more teachers rather than having 40 kids in the classroom. I don't understand what these educating educators and administrators are doing. What are they doing? Creating more jobs for their buddies? Yeah. I mean, what's going on here? The, w- the, the school, the school system and the, uh, and the, uh, the administrative state of school system is top heavy, really top heavy. And these you jobs, these, uh, Scott, these jobs are probably w- very well vice president. Or They're probably vice, very vice well paid jobs. 80, 80 grand or more. Hey, if they, 80 they, grand or more. If they yeah, lo- lose that job, I mean, I was just talking about this the other day. It's uh, you, can go, you can go get truck driving jobs for six figures right now because there's such a need. You can or, get $120,000 a year uh, truck driving job That's what job I've been right hearing, now. yeah. Absolutely. I, I, right, Scott, you know? Scott, I was telling my daughter who's, who is going to NAU, I was saying you, you should just do online schooling and while you're doing uh, while you're driving across the country. You literally could. Yeah. You, you could Nowadays, pull over to sleep your shift. You yeah. got to sleep a 12-hour shift before you can get in the truck and drive again. 
And on your 12 hour sleep shift, take car got about six hours of that to go to school. Yeah. yeah. Heck yeah. Scott, That'd be like the most wise thing she could ever do. Yeah, Exactly. We'll see if she does it or not. Scott, um, one more thing on education. I have, I, I, I thought the legislature would act. I hope they would have act, but it's the backpack of money following the kids. I think if you were to open up that funding to private schools that a, a lot of people would bail on these, like I already bailed from it, but they would bail on these public schools and there would be a reform. There would be this, uh, the marketplace would work if we could free up the money. Are you in favor? Well, now of that? that I now that I know that they've got five vice principals in one school, imagine what they're like at the actual school district level. Oh How gosh. many administrators are within the actual school districts? Yeah, that control the entire district. There's 217 school districts in Arizona. Don't you think we could cut that down to maybe half? I think we could. Just in Mesa alone, there's several school districts. Mesa should have one, maybe two school districts because it's a big city, but it doesn't need to have like several school districts it's, it doesn't make any sense phoenix same way they got multiple school districts when well, maybe they only need one or two you know and, and we could we could take those administrator salaries and apply them back towards the teachers and the classrooms and the students and get the classrooms down to 20 kids a class again get these kids learning properly again and then get up get get new esl programs set up that, that can have larger classes so the non-english speaking kids can get better attention too because when you have a combined class of a lot of non-speaking English kids with English speaking kids, it, it slows both sides down. It slows the non-English speaking kids down, but it also slows down the English speaking kids. You know, we need to expand ESL. When I was a kid, we had ESL. But then again, when I was a kid, we didn't have the numbers of illegal uh, kids in the school districts that we do today. You know, it, it's, it's just so much larger now and, and, where before you might have a couple of classrooms with illegal alien kids speaking Spanish in them. Now you just have to put those children and spread them through all the classrooms because there's just too many. There's too many, you know, but I think what we could do is take some of those administrator salaries and open up some ESL classes, which is English Spanish learning. Okay. And then they could learn at the pace they need to learn. I was going to the ask you kids <laughs> can learn at the pace they need to learn. Yeah. I was going to ask you what that stood for. Okay. Scott, hey, I appreciate you spending all this time with us. Um, a lot of things to fix out there, that's for sure. Um, I, I have your website here, Neely for F O R, Neely for Governor dot com. If folks want to go yep. learn more, and um, I know you got to get going. You've got an event you're yep. heading to, and uh, you've got a lot of work to do here. Before I have a August lot of 2nd. ideas. I have a lot of ideas on that website and I've shot many other videos where I talk about certain subjects so they can really, really study up on what I'm trying to do for the state okay. and they're short videos. So they kind of just tie into what I'm talking about, but in a short way. Yeah. Short nowadays. People need short. <laughs> hey, Scott, I appreciate yeah. it. Best to you. Hey, thank you, brother. I appreciate thank it. Thank you. Don't forget. I do have my election 2022 section of the website. Go to talkwithjeff.com. And as all these candidates come on, we, we get their interviews posted in a separate section. I mean, they're in the podcast, but they're also in a separate section on the website. So you can go back and, and see which candidate's right for you. Go to talkwithjeff.com. Click on election 2022. A lot more to come next hour, including some of your comments. Hang tight. Back in just a few minutes. This is the Jeff Orbit Show on 97.1 The Big Talker. All right, thieves stealing ATMs, thieves stealing toilet paper. Plus, I got a lot of your comments as well and other Arizona news items. Another hour of the show starts now. All right, welcome back to another hour of the show. Jeff Orbit's here. I also have Olivia with me. We've got some thievery stories that we want to share with you. It's crazy. It's like... Yeah, this is out of control. It's crazy. I don't know. Maybe yeah, people have been stealing stuff since the beginning of time, but it just seems to be, uh, it must be the economy, must be everything that's going on, um, and just the general craziness in our in our society. But yeah, we'll, we'll get to those. people have always stolen stuff. Yeah. But it's like, of all the things to steal. Toilet paper. Toilet paper. That, and that's ATM, what you use? And ATM machines. Ay, ay, ay. All right, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, Just Wireless sponsors the listener line. You can leave your comments, uh, and you can also email your comments. Give out the number. Give out the email, Olivia. 877-971-3971, or you can email us, talkwithjeff at iCloud.com. I, 
I still think it should be talk with Olivia since he makes me an, um, read yeah, all the emails read and announce them. Yeah, we have we have one coming up here about a, a new school coming to Flagstaff. Uh, Paige emailed us that, so we'll get to that here in just a second. Uh, Olivia actually is just here with us for this one segment today because she uh, is incredibly know, busy. Incredibly busy. I know that he will later high tell all kinds of um, crazy tales about. Oh yes, she definitely on failed on us. Yeah, but no, that's no. Not well, she hasn't been around much this past or this week, and then some last week because you were doing. Um, uh, play rehearsal, play rehearsal. Yeah, that's why. I, What's the name of the play? That's why I'm not on the show on Thursdays. Yeah, it's, it's play rehearsal. It's but, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. I'm sure a lot of people uh, know that. The Narnia. Lion, the Witch, and the, so um, v- real quick here, she has to leave. She has to get there early, and then I have to leave. Pretty, you know, right as the show ends, I'm bolting out the door so I can get over there in time um, for her play. So we're looking forward to that, and she's got a bunch of wardrobe changes for the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Yes, you have there an understudy. A, there's an actual wardrobe in there, but I'm also having some costume changes. Costume, okay. Do you have an understudy, like you know, in case it was everybody, um, you you know, nowadays, you know, did, nobody got COVID and didn't show up today, and there's like you're missing characters or anything. We were a little scared because <laughs> all week people were like sick or hurt or something, but luckily everyone was there today during our practice. So. That's good. That's good. Hopefully, right. it should be good. Good stuff. Okay, we will get to the thief. Thievery stories here in just a second. I do want to mention our sponsor, WT Wealth Management, uh, Glenn Least. You know, he comes on the program quite often, and uh, he has Intelligent Investing with Glenn Least. Remember, that's on Saturdays at noon on 97.1 The Big Talker. Well worth listening to. This Saturday is uh, part four of our four-part series on on um, investment investing 101. A lot of information that I think... You're going to want to tune in to hear. But if you want to talk with Glenn right now and ins- and ensure your investments have staying power, I mean, right now, look look at what the market's been doing. But markets go up, markets go down, and he talks a lot on the show about um, you know, being patient and and um, and not spazzing out with every little media twitch that's going on. Uh, I'm a client of Glenn Lease and um, you know, he's someone that I rely on to, to, you know, look at my individual situation. Everybody's different. That's why you need to call Glenn and you can get a complimentary consultation, talk with him. Um, and he's very easy to talk with. Glenn Least at 928-225-2474. That's Glenn Least at WT Wealth Management. Give him a call. No obligation. Complimentary consultation at 928-225-2474. Okay, let's get to our um, Arizona news items and we'll start with two uh, criminal th- th- thefts, thieveries, thefts. what do you want to call them? Okay, what's the first one? Okay, so this is from AZ Central. Thieves used a stolen earth mover to rip an ATM out of the ground <laughs> oh while God. police were watching. <clears throat> okay, so residents said it sounded like a gunshot, an explosion, or a violent accident. Hmm. I guess because they hit the uh, they, ATM. They Okay. But the early morning crack that shattered through a sand, uh, Santan Valley neighborhood was a caterpillar earth mover ramming an, NP, it, an ATM. Okay. Police say a crew of thieves used stolen construction equipment to rip the cash machine out of the ground from behind a credit union, load it onto a trailer, and tow it to Mesa. Where the heck is Sant- Okay, I just pulled up the map. Okay, Santan Valley is like southeastern. Fien- well, there's Queen Creek. Where am I here, Olivia? I don't. Okay. Oh, that's. Oh, I know where that is. We we went through that recently. We went down to Tucson, the back way. Um, it it's, all it's kind of. Yeah, we went through. Uh, it, you go south of like Apache Junction, and um, then there's Queen Creek, Santan Valley, kind of right out there in the middle of nowhere. Isn't that kind of like um, the the like the retirement area type place? Am, am I thinking wrong here? Is that farmlands? I have um, no idea. Yeah. Anyway, Pinal County. So they ripped. So they they actually stole the backhoe. To steal the ATM, I know. So there's like, multiple thefts going on here, and then they ram the ba- the, the to make a theft. Yeah, they ram the ATM and then dumped it into the trailer, took it to Mesa. I read this article that they kind of the cops were watching. They followed them because these guys were involved with other stuff. I think it was like three guys or something, and um, it was something like sixty sixty grand in there. What whatever it was, you know, whatever an ATM. Oh, holds. I was gonna say what. Well, uh, 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 what would happen if like they cracked it open and it was like empty or something yeah and it was like was previously cleaned that morning what i read was they took it back to mesa and then one of the guys went to home depot to go get um like cutting blades for like like so they they weren't even ready with that when you'd think they would have just taken the backhoe and just smashed it and opened i mean that's exactly what i would think because if it's 
I feel like, I mean, ripping an ATM out of the ground is extreme, but like yeah, yeah. anybody, I mean, another security, it seems that it would be easier to do it with some kind of tool or something. They're, so they're pretty I tough. would think that it would be tough enough they're, to they're not ver- be they're, harmed they're, by they're that. They're very tough. Actually, if, if you watch, um, and I don't recommend this for, for children or people of younger ages or people um, um, of, of heightened senses as far as when it comes to violence, uh, but there was an episode, do you remember, folks, if you watched Breaking Bad, that series, uh, there was an episode, the ATM episode, where one of the drugged out tweakers or two of them um they ripped the atm out somehow they carried the atm back to their house and they were trying to get it open and, and ultimately it, it ended in a gruesome scene when they jacked it up and was under it trying to jack it up and one of the tweakers like pulled out the jack and anyway i don't need to go into those details but atms are what i'm trying to say is even in hollywood atms are very hard to break into and apparently for these bozos who stole it with the back of Yes, because if it um, was the back easy to break, would be worth I mean, the back is probably worth more than the ATM. I know. It's like just, <laughs> Jeez. Just, okay. Olivia's got another. And folks, if you got any comments, we'd love to hear from you. Talk with Jeff at highcloud.com. Uh, this is the difference. Now, Santan Valley, that's a small rural area, but the, the criminals apparently came from, from Mesa. But Prescott Valley is having a bit of a crime wave as well. Uh, this one hit the Prescott Valley Police uh, Facebook page. This one's really scary, so if anyone, you know, this is really one, sensitive, I wouldn't yeah. listen because it's terrifying. <laughs> you, you you really, uh, you need to be on alert because... The toilet paper <laughs> the thief toilet paper is on the thief. loose. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, so they say, police seek identity of suspect who broke into real estate building okay. on May 10th at approximately 3 a.m., um... An unknown male subject forced his way into Best Homes Real Estate located at uh, 8516 East State Route 69 in Prescott Valley. Maybe we shouldn't have given that address because they apparently have a large supply of toilet paper. But anyway, go on. Well. No, they don't anymore. Yes, a very, very large amount of toilet paper was (laughs) stolen. So much so that they were a target. The subject remained in the business overnight and stole six rolls of toilet paper. Oh, my God. A 4 by 8 cloth lined wire basket, (laughs) a bottle of air freshener. And Ooh. left behind a pink sweatshirt. See, I think this was a – he shouldn't have broken in there, but I think he was attempting a trade without the participation of the other participant. So he left the pink sweatshirt in exchange for six rolls of toilet paper, a uh, cloth-lined wire basket, and a bottle of air freshener. He wouldn't need it not, to be clean. I'm not saying that you should steal anything. No. But if you're going to go to all the trouble to, to break something. into a building in the middle of the night, yeah. you steal six rolls of toilet paper <laughs> – no, I think it was like, a trade. It would be like greatest thefts ever yeah. in the history of the world. If you're going to do it, I, uh, no, we don't recommend you doing it, but if you are going to do it, I'd get a backhoe and run down an ATM. <laughs> At least it, there wasn't a backhoe going. Well, maybe that happened during the great toilet paper crisis of 2020. Remember when maybe. everyone was hoarding toilet paper? Maybe someone smashed into a place with a backhoe to, and loaded up the scoop that the toilet paper and drove down the road. <laughs> it's of all the things, yeah. toilet paper, really, it's like... Oh Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Uh, there, I want to mention uh, something that you can participate in and actually help your, your fellow uh, mankind or womankind. Well, <laughs> mankind's fine. Humans. <laughs> oh, wait, no, that is man in it, too. Yeah, people. They, people kind, humankind. Oh, my God. Okay, anyway, there's a blood drive May 19th uh, from 11 to 4. This is at uh, Little Dealer, Little Prices on Highway 69 in Prescott Valley. Watch out for the toilet paper caper person. Um, I think you'll be okay. They, they probably have this person caught by then. Um, just look for any guy running around without a pink sweatshirt. Uh, but anyway, you can <laughs> you can donate some of your blood and or toilet paper uh, at Little Dealer, Little Prices on Highway 69 in Prescott. Uh, there's going to be some folks from our sister station, Cult Country, down there as well. Uh, they are urging you to pre-book a time for drawing of the blood um, to speed things up. It'd take like 10 minutes or something. Uh, here's what you do. And I did this. I went to uh, vitalint.org, V-I-T-A-L-A-N-T, vitalint.org, and just click on donate. And then it you, you just got to type in Prescott Valley and um, you can set up your time. Click on the little dealer, little prices um, link there. Uh, Arizona Awards, uh, here's here's another one that's very important, and uh, you never thought we'd live in this kind of world. Arizona Awards, a highly sought-after social equity pot licenses. This is from AZ Family. 
Uh, Arizona's public health agency has awarded more than two dozen social equity dispensary licenses under the state's voter approved law legalizing recreational marijuana. Now, Don Harrington, who's the Arizona Department of Health Services interim director, announced in a blog post Tuesday that the 26 license licenses were auctioned off via live stream. Here, here's the deal. I read this whole article. Part of the wording on the um, ballot initiative that went through a couple years ago or last year, whatever it was, legalizing recreational marijuana in Arizona, allowed for 26 licenses for social equity pot licenses because they're saying that certain neighborhoods were uh, targeted uh, for marijuana um, uh, violations when marijuana was illegal. So now they're saying those areas that were uh, predominantly lower income neighborhoods, now they should have these social equity pot licenses and have the pot places open within those neighborhoods, which makes perfect sense. Yeah, so now they can legally get it. <laughs> now they can legally get it. And uh, there you go. So if you um, perhaps a, a socially equitable pot license coming to uh, a neighborhood near you real soon. All right, Olivia, uh, I do want to mention a Marco's pizza because if, if I was making dinner tonight, making, I, I would just make my way to the Marco's pizza and uh, pick up a pizza because that's, that's how I make dinner. That's how I roll. Uh, they've got three locations in Flagstaff. Look, this is a great Flagstaff company, uh, locally owned and operated for over 40 years. You've got owners, Dave and Tommy, and you've heard Dave here on the program before they're present daily. And, uh, I give it my just highest rating. This is the best pizza in, in Northern Arizona. Plus the, some of the best wings and their craft beers and best craft drinks are in awesome. Northern Arizona. Yeah. Best pizza in the state. That best pizza in Arizona, according to Olivia. Maybe they need a new sponsor. You'll, you'll get that next sponsorship because she just, she just topped me. I said Northern Arizona. She says the whole state. Uh, if you want to get curbside pickup or delivery, here's the number 928 779 That's 928 779 Seven nine zero zero two four, uh, or stop by one of their three locations. You got the one over there by Target and West Flagstaff on Milton. You got the one downtown, and you got the one in the Old Village Inn in East Flagstaff, kind of near the Flagstaff Mall. Go check them out. Namarco's Pizza nine two eight seven seven nine zero zero two four. Get a pizza or Namarco's Pizza dot com. Okay, I know you got to get out of here, so get out of here, and you got. Uh, you got to go get changed for the, what is it, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? Yeah. Okay. And uh, so you get there first. I'll be there in just a little bit. And then tomorrow uh, on Friday's big weekly roundup, maybe you can uh, tell us how it all went. I'll, I'll, I'll review it. Should I review it? Um, tomorrow? Sure. Should I pull some clips? But you're required to give me a good review. got to do a good or review. Or else you will actually be fired from the Olivia show. Oh, no. Okay. That's okay. I'm, I'm kind of ready for a vacation anyway. All right, Olivia, good luck. Folks, hang tight. Don't go anywhere. Back in just a minute. I got to muscle through the last segment on my own. Olivia's taken off. She's got her play coming up, which I'll be taking off here in just a, about 15 minutes. And uh, looking forward to that. I'd love to hear from you. Looking forward to any of your comments as well. I've got one I want to get to from Paige here regarding a, a new school in the Flagstaff area that may be the answer for some folks. It's a sounds like a smaller school, though. And I'm hoping more and more of these small schools open up uh, throughout our state as time goes by. Start getting rid of some of these behemoth school districts. If you were listening last hour, I was talking with candidate for governor Scott Neely. Uh, he's one of, you know what, I should I should pull that up. He's one of five. I actually have a, maybe a six on, as far as the uh, Republican. I'm going to talk with Jeff right now. Talk with Jeff.com right now. I have actually an election 2022 section. So go to talk with Jeff.com and right up top, uh, the top bar with all the links, how to listen, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, click on election 2022. And uh, Scott's not up there yet because he was just on during the four o'clock hour. Uh, but we're putting up all the candidates that come here on the program as they come on, you know, within a couple hours after they're on uh, up there. So you can go back and listen. So if you miss anybody, 
Uh, like right now for the Arizona governor's race, uh, we still got to put up, actually, we're missing, uh, Carrie Lake. Carrie Lake was on the program on Tuesday. Uh, we've got Carrie Lake, we're Paula Tuliani Zen, Matt Salmon, and then we'll have, uh, Scott Neely up there. U.S. Senate race, we've got Jim Lehman, we've got Blake Masters, we've got people from Corporation Commission, LD, um, seven race, uh, CD2 race for Congress, on and on. So we're keeping this up to date and it's just their interviews up there so you can listen and say, hey, is this person, you know, worthy of my vote. Is this person somebody that I could see sitting in public office, hopefully, hopefully being a public servant and not a, you know, drag on society, which many of them have become. Uh, but anyway, here's the candidates. I have a list actually directly to the Arizona Secretary of State's website. So for governor on the Republican side, uh, Steve Gaynor has withdrawn. So there's only five candidates remaining running for governor. Uh, there's Carrie Lake. There's Scott Neely. Matt Salmon, T- uh, Karen Taylor Robson, who I've sent, um, th- I-, I think we are at two invitations now. She will get a third and final invitation. So if anyone knows Karen Taylor Robson, uh, we would love, we're not getting through for whatever reason. We're going through their official channels as far as contacts. Can't get her on. So uh, we're going to invite her one more time here next week. Then we'll start re-inviting the other candidates, and uh, she'll have missed that boat. But I will hold out hope that we can still get her. And, and Paula uh, Tuliani Zen, um, there is actually a, a sixth candidate that's a write-in candidate, um, Patrick Fennard. Fennard, F-I-N-E-R-D. I don't know if we're going to do the write-in candidate. Um uh, but we are doing all the candidates that got the, the signatures during the signature period time. Anyway, uh, go check that out. Talk with Jeff.com. Click on uh, election 2022 and you can listen to any of those interviews. Uh, I've got more news items I want to get to plus this email from Paige. I want, I've got some more inflation information sp- specific to Arizona after yesterday's CPI numbers came out. The wholesale uh, prices, uh, came, producer price index came out today as well. That thing spiked really high. So I'll give you the details here in just a second. Uh, I do want to tell you, speaking of the economy and speaking of interest rates and the, and, and things inflating, the interest rates have been going up. I don't know where they're going to go, but I can tell you that I'm working on a refinance right now with Kim Dawson over at Nova Home Loans. Uh, she has been super help, helpful for me the entire way through. I've talked to uh, some listeners over the past year who have used Kim Dawson and they all just loved working with her. Uh, Kim, you know, she'll, she's going to go out and find the programs that's going to work for you. Uh, because, because Nova's both a bank and a broker and she has the flexibility to shop for the best rates and terms. Uh, here's another good thing that Kim will do for you. She'll waive the lender fees on all VA loans. So that's really cool that she's doing that. Uh, give Kim Dawson a call at Nova Home Loans. Whether you're looking to buy a home right now or you're looking to refinance a home, uh, I, I don't know. I don't have a crystal ball, but I would expect interest rates to be higher next year. You never know with this stuff, but that's why I decided to refinance now. I should have done it a year ago, granted, and Kim told me I should have, but you know, I procrastinated a bit. Uh, but give Kim Dawson a call. She'll help you out. She'll talk with you and uh, walk you through this whole process. 928-310-6458. That's 928-310-6458, 928-310-6458, Nova Home Loans, NMLS 3087, terms and conditions may apply, BK number 0902429, an equal housing opportunity. Uh, okay, we covered the social equity pot licenses. Um, here's one that will lead into some education news, and this one just caught my eyes while I was glancing around Arizona news items, uh, as we do every day. Uh, Dysart Unified School district uh the the dysert unified superintendent left the position it's been like a you know turmoil year or whatever so they got rid of the person but they leave with a severance package of three hundred and twelve thousand dollars and this this just goes in what we were talking about yesterday with my guest um uh, amy carney and that's a great interview if you want to listen to that that's up on talkwithjeff.com or your favorite podcast providers and we we're just talking about how these schools are just burning through money she she went into great detail yesterday about 190 billion dollars that the the feds are pushing around the country this SR money this these funds SR1 SR2 SR3 you know they have all these weird names but it was the covid relief money for all the schools and she went into detail about specifically and she's down in um the Mesa area and she's running for uh, school board down there which you know is good we need more and more people to do this she talked about Flagstaff Unified School District that's received over $21 million 
in this temporary COVID, you know, money, part of this $190 billion. But they, they've used the things for like, uh, this panorama data that is all into the social and emotional learning. Uh, so they don't really have to use the money for, oh, oh, and they've hired a, um, what was that called? A, a, um, a disease investigator. So they put this person on the payroll, disease investigator. And what happens when the money runs out? Now, as you know, schools like Flagstaff Unified School District were flagged by, uh, the auditor general as being at, at risk, financial risk. And they pointed specifically the state auditor general to FUSD's reliance on one time COVID money. So when I see schools, and I know I'm tying different school districts together here, but it, this happens all the time. When you see a school district, like Dysert Unified, the superintendent, getting $312,000 as a severance package. You just scratch your heads and you say, what, what world do these people live in? And it's it's gone so far from actually serving uh, the people and the kids and, and more about the institution and keeping that going. I would be all for, and we were talking this, about this with Scott Neely last hour, candidate, the guy running for governor, and um, he mentioned something about um, the size of the school district. And I said, I, I'd be all for breaking them up. Uh, he said that, um, was it Scottsdale? He said Scottsdale School District, where his kid goes, they had one principal and five vice principals. It's just, what is that? And then, they, of course, they have the administrative offices and all that. I would love to see a school district, these bigger ones, that the unified school districts ununify. I, I mean, what's the problem with having a high school that has a principal and a vice principal and somebody who runs the administrative office and, you know, a school nurse? And, you know, you just have the... You just have the, the core people right there, and you run that school. Why, why does everything have to be unified and so large? But anyway, there is a new school coming to Flagstaff that's a little smaller, and this came from Paige, who emailed us, and you can email us anytime. Uh, talk with Jeff at iCloud.com, and Paige said this, Hi, I thought you might be interested to learn a, of a new charter school opening in Flagstaff this fall uh, that is supposedly more on the conservative side. And she says she's looking into it for her three boys. Uh, it's called Leading Edge Academy and has been operating in the Valley for 30 years. They're currently hiring teachers for the Flagstaff location. And then she sent with me, sent in the email a picture of the postcard she got and, um, you know, basically saying what she, what she just said that they're now enrolling grades K through, through eight. Uh, but she wanted to stress that it, and, and they stress in their, in their, um, uh, pamphlet here that it's small class sizes, um, free full day kindergarten, art, music, sports, technology, and uniforms and character education. Uh, here's what Paige is saying. She says it's free grades K through eight, Monday through Thursday, eight to two thirty, and Fridays are half day. Classes are capped at 25 which is good. She says in bold capital letters, no CRT, no critical race theory. Uh, Paige says that masks have always been optional. Uh, they also have, and this says something a lot, a lot right here, uh, for this school. Uh, Paige is saying that they have optional chapel for the kids on Fridays. Uh, Paige also says uniforms are required and it's character based curriculum. Uh, uniforms used to be required at that Northland Preparatory Academy as well. My kids went there. That used to be kind of the premier school to go to. And then I saw it degrade over time as we were going there. And it's, it's a shame because they were, they used to be ranked as one of the best schools in Arizona and they were really strict and you had to have uniforms. There was a strict, maybe it wasn't quite uniforms. There was a strict dress, dress code. Like you'd be wearing slacks. You'd have to, you couldn't wear jeans. Uh, now, now it's just anything goes. And when we were disappointed, that's when we realized there was a change coming. Not that I'm big on uniforms, but just having somewhat of a professional atmosphere when you go to these places and teaching these kids some discipline, which is uh, sorely missing in our society. Uh, and then of course they went full on diversity, equity, and inclusion and all this CRT stuff. So anyway, Paige, thank you for that email. I hope that this is a school that's Maybe we'll help folks in Flagstaff because Flagstaff does not have a lot of options. I, FUSD is where most people go. Look, you can go to the um, Catholic school. Uh, my kids go to Flagstaff Christian school. Uh, but then it gets, I, I don't know what else is left there, especially on the charter side or in the public school side, uh, other than homeschooling options and things like that, which are great options for a lot of people, but not for everybody. So maybe Leading Edge Academy will, will help out in Flagstaff. Uh, we shall see, and I'll try to reach out to them and, and get them on the program. Uh, let's see here. Let's switch to, I don't have much time. I mean, we've got about four minutes, and then i got to hit the hit the road and get over to Olivia's play. Uh, 
as you know, yesterday we talked about inflation and inflation. The CPI numbers came out yesterday and they went down a whopping like two tenths of a percent. It was 8.3% annualized inflation, which means 16.6% in the real world. Because all the numbers add up to that when you, when you look at this. And I have some Arizona numbers here since the CPI figures came out. Uh, here's an article though from CNBC. Inflation is costing average households an extra $311 per month, per month. And that's hurting a lot of people. We know that. And I know a lot of you are listening. And I know people are, are struggling because of the, the, the price increases. Uh, when you look at the markets in Arizona, that CPI breaks down. Phoenix, for example, and most of that is going to be in Phoenix. I, I think I have a couple of data points here for Flagstaff, but most is in Phoenix. Phoenix used cars, according to the latest numbers, have gone up 21% in the last year. And I have an article here from 3TV out of Phoenix. Uh, there's a company called IC Cars, and their executive uh, analyst, Carl Brower, said in a press release, quote, the average lightly used car is currently just 1% or $454 less than a new version. You get that? So, so the average lightly used car is, le- is worth just a little bit less than a, than a, um, than a new car. That's crazy. And when you compare that to prices before the microchip shortage, when the average lightly used car costs 17% less, you see that used car prices are still well above normal. Um, so, so when I see that inflation is 8, 8.3%, and, but you're spending 21% more on cars, um, and you're spending a whole bunch more on food, um, we know the numbers are totally bogus. Now, gas hit a record high yesterday in Arizona at $4.67 per gallon, uh, according to AAA. The wholesale numbers came out today. This is the producer price index. Uh, economists, this is an article from Fox Business News. Economists were predicting that it was going to be like 10, oh, 10.7% increase, so year-over-year increase. This is the... Um, this is the wholesale level level. So this is the stuff that the companies are buying before it reaches the actual consumers. It actually, instead of the, the estimate of going up 10.7%, it actually went up uh, 11%. So I, I, I know people got all excited yesterday when, when inflation dropped from 8.5% to 8.3%, but with the wholesale numbers being at more than they expected, uh, I think last month they were 11% as well. This month they're 11%. Uh, I think you can expect more and more inflation going forward. And uh, it may stabilize, but I don't see it going much down below 8% anytime soon. We shall see, though. By the way, Phoenix inflation, the national number that came out yesterday was 8.3%. Uh, Phoenix inflation is CPI 11%. 11%, so 2, uh, 8, 8, 9, 10, 3, nearly 3 points higher than the national average. Flagstaff, the only other data point I could find in Arizona, uh, had an inflation rate of 8.9%. And again, the national rate was 8.3%. So Flagstaff, Phoenix, Arizona um, is is a much higher inflation rate than the rest of the state, or country, I should say. All right, uh, final sponsor today here is Gutter Helmet, and Gutter Helmet of Northern Arizona, great company. Uh, they have their great reverse curve system that deflects the pine needles, keeps all that junk out of your gutters. You know, in the summertime, and the springtime right now, it keeps the stuff out so it doesn't catch on fire, as Rob Wilson was explaining happened to his gutters. Uh, it'll deflect everything in the winter so you don't have ice damming. Uh, give my friend Carl, the gutter helmet man, a call right now. You can call or text and uh, ask. mention the Jeff Orbit Show. You can save up to 30%. And, and that's a great deal, and Carl will help you out. And this is, again, a great northern Arizona company. Here's the number, 928-318-6555. That's Gutter Helmet of Northern Arizona. Call or text 928-318-6555. That's 928-318-6555. Or you can go to gutterhelmetsnaz.com. All right, that's it for today. I have to get out of here. We're going to go to Olivia's play. We'll tell you about it tomorrow. Tomorrow's a big weekly roundup, so I hope you join me for that. Uh, and if you've got any comments, I'd love to hear from you. Send me an email, talkwithjeff at iCloud.com. Have a great, safe night. See you back here tomorrow. Take care. <laughs>